All right, so now we're going to basically phrase um, for our definition, our, our newly defined concept of limits of functions. Uh, it turns out that there's like another, there's an alternative definition uh, instead of sequences, right? The way we defined limits was using sequences, limits of functions, I mean. Uh, and so much like with continuity, uh, we could also just, have, as, just as well have defined the limit of a function in terms of the epsilon, some, some kind of epsilon delta property, basically. Um, so we're going to look at that now. We're going to prove that that's an equivalent property uh, for a function to have in order for the limit to exist uh, based on, you know, it's equivalent to the definition we actually made, which uses sequences. So uh, the proof of this really mimics, like, very closely uh, the proof that the epsilon delta property for continuity is equivalent to the sequential definition of continuity. Um, I'll go through it anyway, since I think it might be good, you know, reinforcement uh, for you guys. But uh, yeah, just do bear in mind that like it's it's almost an exact clone of the other proof. So, um, all right. So here's the theorem. Uh, let f be a function. Uh, defined on S subset of R. Um, let A be a real number. Uh, is the limit of a sequence in S. Note also that we can like more succinctly phrase this condition as just A is in the closure of S. Uh, I don't know, kind of a fun thing. Um, so, and uh, let L be a, well, yeah, let L be a real number. Okay. Uh, then uh, the limit as X approaches A along S of f of x equals l if and only if um, for all epsilon greater than zero uh, there exists a delta greater than zero such that um, for all x in s with absolute value of x minus a less than delta, um, we have f of x minus l less than epsilon. OK, so this is the epsilon delta property for limits. And you'll notice, I mean, it looks almost indistinguishable <laughs> from you know the definition of continuity. Uh, where instead of domain of f, we just have the set s here, basically. So uh, yeah, it's it's almost exactly the same. Uh, I'm going to try to like expedite the proof here a little bit, so I, I won't get be like super detailed. So uh, so if we suppose the limit as x approaches a long s, or no 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 no. Let's do the other direction first. So suppose the epsilon delta property holds, uh, then let xn uh, approach, you know, well, be a sequence in S with limit A. Uh, so then and let epsilon be greater than zero, then there exists delta greater than zero such that um, yada yada from the epsilon delta property, right? And then, uh, so then, um, right, eventually xn gets within delta of a, right? So for some n, Right. Uh, there exists an n such that 
for all n greater than capital N, xn minus a is less than delta. So for n greater than this n, um, we have uh, by the by the choice of delta, right? F of xn minus f of or minus l, sorry, is less than epsilon. So f of xn goes to l, right? Very good. So we just use the epsilon delta property to control, you know, control how close the values at xn are to l. Uh, and then we use the this convergence of xn to control how close xn is to a to make it be within delta. And that's, that's basically it, right? Now, so suppose um, the, uh, suppose the limit uh, well, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. You know, this actually doesn't have to be a contradiction proof also. This could just be contraposition. I don't know why the book does it this way, but I mean, whatever. Like the book can drop the assumption that the limit equals L, but okay. So the limit as X approaches a s of f of x equals l a along s sorry is the proper wording um, but the epsilon delta property fails then uh, for so then there exists an epsilon which breaks the epsilon delta property, right, for f at l, um, or sorry, for f at a, I guess. Right, well, I mean, whatever. Breaks the epsilon delta property that we are assuming is failing, right? Uh, then, so then, uh, so for each, n, uh, we can find xn in s specifically with absolute value of xn minus a uh, less than 1 over n, but absolute value of f of xn minus l greater than or equal to epsilon. Uh, so f of xn does not converge for this sequence xn. Uh, so, you know, the xn, this xn sequence that we constructed goes to a and xn is in s for each n, but f of xn does not approach l, which is a contradiction. I, I don't know. Some people like to do this like double arrow thing, whatever. Contradiction, right? So we just proved that the, the limit is not actually L in this case. So that's the other direction of the proof, okay? Okay, so that's the epsilon delta property. I'm gonna, so now we're gonna continue on a little bit here. So the real like utility of this theorem, so we just proved the theorem in like sort of full generality for, you know, a general set um, S basically. But if you apply it, if you apply the statement to like specific types of like the, like the special types of limits we define, like the, the one sided limits or the two sided limits or whatever, then you can get like corresponding sort of epsilon delta properties for all of these different types of limits basically. So I'm going to state a couple of them, right? So So this is for um, two sided limits uh, where a is a real number and L is a real number. So, uh, so let F be defined on J without the point A for some open interval J uh, containing 
a and let l be a real number uh then the limit as x approaches a of f of x and remember this is the two-sided limit equals l if and only if uh so i'm going to state the epsilon delta property for two-sided limits now so for all epsilon greater than zero there exists a delta greater than zero such that um, for all x uh, with zero less than x minus a less than delta we have um, we have um, we have um, absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Okay, so notice a couple of slight differences here. For one thing, we don't have an x in s or like x in j without a because the point is that we can choose delta small enough that like all of the x's that satisfy this property are automatically in this interval anyway. So we don't we can drop the like x in s part uh, as long as the as long as delta is small enough. And that and the point is we're just ex claiming there exists some delta, so we can like choose a really small delta, right? So um, also the other thing is like we have a zero less than here, right? And the reason zero is less than is that that way that prevents x from equaling a, right? Because a is not actually in the set s. Like if we call this s, right? S is the set j without the point a here, and j is like an open interval. So uh, since a is not an s, we we can't let this condition allow for x to equal a. So that's why we have the zero less than. But then basically, as long as x satisfies these two inequalities, that ensures is if we chose delta correctly, that ensures that x is actually in this set. So that's why you can just state it this way. Okay. Um, we'll do one more. Uh, so I believe this is yeah. Corollary. Uh, so this is right a one-sided. Right, okay. So let f be defined uh, on some in interval a, b, uh, and let l be a real number. Um, then the limit as x approaches a from the right of f of x equals l, if and only if. Now the epsilon delta for the right-handed limit, when the limit is finite, also notice that like we're assuming l is finite in these cases. So yeah, I'll talk about that in a sec, but uh, so for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that now we have for all x with zero less than x or sorry not zero less than x what am i talking about for all x with a less than x less than a plus delta uh, we have f of x minus l less than epsilon right so okay anyway so it, the here the only difference is this a now we have a less than x less than a plus delta right and that's clearly because we only care about values of x to the right of a okay and of course, again, it's like if you choose delta small enough, this will automatically be like all the x that satisfy this will automatically be in this set. So you don't have to like put x in a, b here. You can just say for all x values with that satisfy this, right? So, okay, just a couple comments about this. And this is kind of about like discussion 20.9, which I strongly recommend you read. I'm not going to go through all of it, but basically um, there are a lot of different combinations of like, okay, what goes here, okay, okay, like this, right, and this, or sorry, actually, I guess really it's like this, this, and this are kind of like all possibly, like those things can all change, right? This could be like, um, I guess actually, you can think of this all as like one thing, really. 
So this could be, um, we could replace with, Um, like a minus, um, or like, I mean, we had a and a plus a minus and then like infinity or negative infinity. And then here we could replace this with like infinity could replace, um, with infinity and negative infinity. I'm not saying you can just, I'm not saying that you can replace these things like this and, and not, not modify this statement. Obviously, like if you change what's here and what's here, you have to change what's over here. But the point is there are all these different combinations that you can consider. And then you can come up with like a different epsilon delta property for each one, right? So like here, it's like we replaced A with A plus, and then we changed the epsilon delta property accordingly, right? And so like the things that can change are like, this condition, which depends on this thing, right? So actually, let me kind of like change this. Let's kind of be fancy about this. So, so like this could be, okay, could change to plus or minus infinity. So then, um, so this thing kind of varies according to what's over here. And then like this thing varies and this thing varies according to, oh, sorry, sorry. This varies, uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, so it's the epsilon varies depending on what's here. And then the um, delta changes depending on what's here, right? Because like if L, for example, if L was like infinity, then it wouldn't be for all epsilon greater than zero. It would be for all like capital M. And then you'd want to make F of X be bigger than capital M or something like that, right? Or if, if this, if A was like infinity, instead of a delta here, you'd have like, uh, you know, some like capital M kind of thing or something. And then you'd say like for A, you know, for, for X bigger than capital M or something like that, right? Uh, so, so depending on, what these things are, uh, you change these statements. So that actually leads me to the lecture question for this uh, lecture. So this is lecture <clears throat> 14, question one, uh, formulate the um, epsilon delta type, I'll say epsilon delta type property for um, the limit, let's say the limit as X approaches a minus F of X equals infinity. Yeah, let's do that one, okay? So, um, you know, take a minute, think about it, write down your answer, include it with your homework. And when you unpause, I will solve it. Okay, so it's not, I mean, hopefully, I mean, if you just read the discussion here, like you can just figure out the answer that way if you want. But I think it's good to kind of just think about it yourself because hopefully by now you've kind of developed the instinct for like what the property should be, right? The property should be, uh, so, instead of epsilon, right? Because we're not trying to get f of x to be within epsilon of like something. We're just trying to get f of x to be big. So for all m in R, there exists. And now since x is approaching a, and here we're assuming a is like a real number, right? Because actually this symbol with a minus doesn't make sense for a being like infinity or negative infinity. That just doesn't make sense. So A is implicitly a real number. Sorry, I guess I should have said that before. Okay, whatever, it doesn't matter. So anyway, yeah, A is implicitly a real number. So there exists a uh, delta, right? Delta gets us close to a real number such that um, for all X with uh, 
a minus delta less than x less than a, we have f of x greater than m. Okay? No absolute value, by the way, just raw f of x greater than m. So anyway, uh, that is it for this section. And then we have one more uh, where I'll show that when you have two one-sided limits that agree with each other, then the two-sided limit exists and agrees with the two one-sided limits and vice versa.